I love the outdoors and I love to be out in the wilderness. Honestly, the further away from civilization, the better. But the reality is, is that early in my land navigational career, I lived in constant fear of becoming lost. It's kind of funny, I often look at land navigation as a metaphor for the Christian walk. You see, I can have a map to figure out where I am, but the map by itself is somewhat confusing until you have a compass to orient it to the terrain and help you really see what it is you're looking at. But I've come to realize that the compass is probably more important than the map. You see, if I lose my way or lose my map, the compass is still there to hold true and to keep me going in one direction. And if I stay to one direction when I'm lost, sooner or later, I'm gonna come across a road or a river or maybe even a stream that I can follow to a known point and eventually reach civilization. I'm not really lost. It's kind of funny. It's sort of a metaphor for my spiritual life. The Bible is the map and it helps me understand where I am. But Jesus, Jesus is the compass. He's always true and he keeps me on track. Search the world, but it couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade, are never enough. You came along, yeah. and you put me back together. Here in your love, well, let's stand and sing. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you.
There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. so good to have you here. We serve an amazing God. And let me read to you briefly from Psalm 30. It says, Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you, you healed me. You, Lord, you brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. So sing the praises of the Lord. You, his faithful people, praise his holy name because you turn my wailing to dancing. You remove my sackcloth and you clothe me with joy that my heart may sing your praise and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning that you are faithful. Lord, that you have saved us. Lord, that you have called us your friends. Lord, that when we were in desperation, Lord, you reached down and said, I will save you. I will provide a because I am the truth and I am the life. I am the one you need. I am the one you need and I am good and I am faithful and I will restore you and I will bring honor to myself through your very life. So God, we thank you this morning that we are yours. We thank you this morning that we can be called sons and daughters of God and it is that spirit that we worship you now as a thankful people and all God's people said, Amen. Let's lift him up this morning.
Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Our fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God
as children said. Amen, amen. Hey, would you take a moment to say hello to a few folks around you? Good morning. I am Pastor Trevor, and I have breaking news for you today. CFC are celebrating Christmas Eve on December 24th. Breaking news? No. Maybe not. We do it every year. But do you know that t December 24th, Christmas Eve, is one of those times, special times in the year, when you can invite someone to church, and they will probably say, maybe, or even, yes. It's one of those special times of the year when people are open to come to church. So we want to encourage you to think about that and pray about that and who you might invite. Uh, we're having three services during Christmas Eve at uh, 3.30, 5.15, and 7 p.m. And uh, they're all the same service, but you can bring someone to hear the message of Jesus. Uh, and some of you want to have a service where we have uh, Mass only. And that will be at 5.15 p.m. in the gathering. And the service will be uh, piped in there, shown in there on the screen at 5.15 p.m. on Christmas Eve in the gathering. So great things are happening. And let's be praying that God will help us to lift up Jesus. We've been singing about his resurrection. It starts with his birth, his coming, but all that he has accomplished. We can celebrate it. And uh, that's what it's all about. So let me give you those announcements. Uh, we, we will be having childcare during the services. That's also an opportunity to serve because if we're planning to have childcare, we need people to take care of the kids. And so if you're able to do that, and this is an opportunity to serve on Christmas Eve, at least during one of the services, uh, you can email emily at cesc.church or talk to some of us after the service about helping out in that way. An important way to help out. Let me also say, since I'm here, there are quiet rooms down each of these corridors. If uh, you have a kid with you and they get rowdy during the message, you can take them there and still enjoy the message. And also want to say thank you for giving. You give through the offering time here when we receive the offering. Lots of you give online and through the app and so on, and we appreciate all of that support as well. We couldn't do it without it, so thank you. And... Uh, we want to continue to worship now. Get back to singing and to praising our great God. So I invite you to pray with me now, and then we'll return to worship, and we'll also receive the offering as well. But let's pray. Father, we do want to thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his birth, for his life, for his death, and for his resurrection, and that he will return. These are the things we base our lives on, Lord, and we, we thank you for that. And we pray that you will help us today in a fuller way to appreciate that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. We ask you that you help those who are sad or troubled today, especially and in including those who were in the path of those tornadoes this week, that you will help them, help us to indeed look to Jesus for comfort and strength. And we pray that even as we continue in your service, in, in this service, that we will be directed in our thoughts and in our hearts to put more of our trust and our reliance and our devotion in Jesus Christ. May your spirit help us. And we pray this in his powerful name. Amen.
the disciples were on a spiritual and emotional roller coaster. I mean, life was up and down, up because Jesus was Jesus. He was doing miracles. He, he, was, he was serving the disciples in an amazing way, and yet at the same time, the disciples were confused. At times, they, they were not just confused, their hearts were, were troubled, and I think that's helpful to know just because if you're following Jesus, there will be times when, when, when life with Jesus is good, and there will be times when life with Jesus is hard and confusing and troubling, and that just helps us to sort of balance out our sense of expectation, and the disciples is the, are encountering this time with Jesus where life is, is chaotic, where the teaching is hard. That's, well, it's not unexpected. In fact, if I could just draw your attention to one of the verses I think is, is the most profound verses in the Bible, one of the most helpful, it's in Isaiah chapter 55, and it says this about God, uh, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let's just pause with that and pray. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for, for your scripture and for your truth. We thank you, Father, for your, your comfort. And we pray that we would encounter Christ as we read this passage. And we pray for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to ask you, how do you respond to God when his ways are not your ways and when his thoughts are far above your own? I mean, how, how do you respond to God? And I think how, the question which we might think about is, how do we respond to God when our hearts are troubled because we don't understand what God is doing or what God is saying? How do we respond to him? What do we do? Now, Jesus has some words for us that are very comforting words, and they're all about who he is. And, and so the identity of Jesus is the one who gives us a sense of comfort and of purpose and of direction. And I want to take you to the, to the words of Jesus to give comfort to our hearts. But before I can do that, I think we have to start with the disciples, the disciples who were on that roller coaster of emotion, a spiritual roller coaster, an intellectual roller coaster. And it begins with John chapter 13. And in John 13, the disciples are gathered together, all 12, and Jesus does something very unexpected. He, he takes a towel and he wraps it around his waist and he gets a bowl of water and he begins to wash the disciples' feet and to dry it with the towel. He's doing the work of a servant. And this is, well, it's overwhelming to the disciples. In fact, Peter initially refuses to allow Jesus to do such a humble act. And Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you won't be clean. And Peter says, then, then wash me. And you can just imagine the sense of privilege that the disciples must feel that Jesus is doing such a humble and intimate act and in washing their feet. That's a high, a spiritual high, but then immediately it's followed by a spiritual low and Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And in, the disciples have this sense of incredible suspicion that about each one, they're looking around, who could it be? Who is it that's going to betray Jesus? And how could they? How could somebody betray Jesus who has just washed our feet? How could somebody betray Jesus who has fed the 5,000, who gives healing to the blind and to the paralyzed, Jesus who raises the dead? How could somebody betray him? And then, to make matters worse, Jesus says, I'm leaving, and you won't be able to follow me. And you can just imagine the disciples' heads are spinning. Here, Jesus has been washing our feet. Now somebody's going to betray us. Jesus says he's leaving. And then uh, Jesus gives sort of one parting command to the disciples. He says, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you, which would be a great command if he hadn't just said, one of you is going to betray me. When Jesus is speaking like this, you can just imagine that all the disciples have this just a turmoil of emotions that just all jumbled up like a tangle of, of Christmas lights, their emotions and, and, and even their sense of sort of spiritual equilibrium is all, all tangled up. And Peter then begins to speak with Jesus. I'm, I'm reading from John chapter 13, verse 36. He says, Lord, where are you going? I, I hear somebody's gonna betray you, but you also said you're leaving and we can't follow. And so Jesus, where are you going? Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now but you will follow afterward. And Peter says, Lord, 
Why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. I mean, that's such a bold statement, right? I mean, Peter is basically saying, I know there's a, one of us. You know, I can't believe it, but one of us is a betrayer. But me? Jesus, somebody here might betray you, but it won't be me. In fact, I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus responds to Peter and he says, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Disciples have just had this swirl of emotions and now that Jesus has washed their feet, then said there is a betrayer in the midst of them, then said he's leaving now, but you should love one another except there's a betrayer. And then Peter, the one who's been the rock, Peter who has been the leader, he's going to betray Jesus three times before morning. It's, a, it's an understatement to say that the hearts of the disciples are troubled. Is your heart troubled? Is your heart troubled this morning? I mean, spiritually or emotionally. Intellectually, are you, are you tangled up? Jesus wants to speak to us today, and he's speaking to us through his scripture. It's, it's the word of life. I want us to hear his words. These are the words of Jesus. John chapter 14. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Let me just repeat that. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you also may be. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. What a great passage. And I think if we're going to understand this passage fully, we have to understand a distinction between two words, two small words, the word a and the word the. We have to understand the distinction between those to understand the significance of what Jesus is saying and to have our hearts comforted. Challenged, yes, but also comforted. And so let's understand the difference between using the word a and using the word the. Notice Jesus says in verse six that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He does not say, I am a way, I'm a truth, I'm a life. No, he's, he claims to be the way, the exclusive way, the authentic, the original. And there's a big difference between the and a. So for example, there's a big difference between the Mona Lisa and a Mona Lisa, right? The Mona Lisa is worth $367 million, the Mona Lisa. A Mona Lisa, you can buy for 14 bucks on Amazon. So there's a huge difference between the, the original, the, 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 the genuine, and A. Jesus says, I'm the way. If Jesus had said, I'm a way, then he would have been optional. You could choose Jesus or you could choose something else or some other way. He's just a way. He's a way to get to the Father, but he's not the way, but he doesn't say that. Jesus says with clarity, I am the way. He is the only way, the exclusive way to God the Father. Now let's talk about the way. Why is it important that Jesus claims to be and says, I am the way? Why is that important? Well, it's important because of this. If your heart is troubled, like the disciples, because life is hard and life is challenging, and if your heart is troubled, if, if you have questions, intellectual questions, which is legitimate. If you have legitimate intellectual questions and you're saying, I don't know what to do with this, well, you need the Father. The Father, he's the answer to our troubled hearts. He's the answer to our troubled questions. We need a Father, not just, not just any Father. We need the Father, the Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be his name. You see, Jesus is claiming to be the way to the Father. Not just a Father. Every one of us has had 
a father, an imperfect father, a human father, but Jesus is saying, I am the way to the father, the consummate father, the father who's in heaven. Now, let me tell you about this father who's in heaven and why we need to find our way to him. It's because in 2 Corinthians, we read that he is the father of compassion and the God of comfort. The father of compassion for people who are struggling, who are suffering. He's a compassionate God. He's a comforting God. He's, he is a father to us. And Jesus is claiming to be the way to the father who is full of compassion and full of comfort. Let me say two things about this way. It is exclusive and it is inclusive. It is exclusive in this, that there is no other way. He is the only way. That's exclusive. But it's inclusive in the sense that all who want to can take this way. It's inclusive in the sense that whoever would believe in Jesus can come to the Father. In fact, if I could just quote to you from several passages of Scripture that show the inclusive offer of Jesus, that anyone can come onto this path, this way. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. All those whose hearts are heavy, come to me, all. And then in John 3.16, we read this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever, whosoever, that means you, that means, that means the person that you work with, that means the uncle that you have who's sort of strange, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's, it's whosoever. This is the way, but it's the way which anybody who wants to can travel. All, whoever, but it is the only. All are invited, but there is only one way to the Father of comfort. Now, if you're driving down this troubled road of life and you're finding that it's, it's hard, and it is, I think if we're honest, we just should acknowledge that life is, is hard. It, do you know what helps on a hard journey? Having a great destination. Having a great destination, a, a place that you're going to that makes the journey worthwhile. That's, that's what's helpful. In fact, it's what's needed when the journey is difficult. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, he's saying it to you and to me as well, that he is going to prepare a place. It's a destination. He's preparing a place for you, the Father's house. I just think it's interesting that Jesus, when he was on earth, his father was a carpenter, so Jesus had training as a carpenter, and then he's going to prepare a house with many rooms for you. If it wasn't so, he wouldn't have told you, but he has told you and he's truthful so you can believe it. He is going to prepare a place for you, but the place is not what gives us comfort. It's the person. You see, the house is the Father's house and he is the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. And so to people who are troubled, Jesus is speaking to them and he's saying, I'm going, but I will come back and I will bring you with me and I will take you home to the Father's house where there are many rooms. The Father of compassion, the God of all comfort. We're on this weary road of life, but there is a place and a person for us that can comfort our troubled hearts, and that place is heaven, that person is the Father, and the way there is Jesus. Now, years ago, I was, I was driving, and I saw this just, it was a magnificent house, a beautiful house up on a, on a steep hill, and it overlooked the city. It was a gorgeous house. And there was a, a big wrought iron fence that went all the way around the bottom of the hill. And there was only one way to the top of that, of, that, of that hill. Only one way to get to the house. It was a narrow road that led up, up, up to the house. There was no back road. There was no hidden path. It was the only way. And Jesus is speaking to us and to his disciples. He's saying, I am the way, the only way, the exclusive way to God the Father. He is the way, and that means that you are not the way. It's not you. It's not your work. It's not your practice of religion. It's not your understanding of the scriptures. It's not what you have provided to the poor. It's not what you've given to the church. It's not your suffering. It's not your posturing. It's not your pastor. It's not your parents. The way 
is Jesus and only Jesus. Jesus is the way. He's explaining this not only to his disciples, but he's explaining it to us. He wants us to understand there's one doorway that opens up to God, and that is Christ himself, the person of Jesus. This is not the only place where Jesus makes this claim. It's not the only place where the scripture makes this claim. But let me just give you two places where something very similar is said. In 1 Timothy 2.5, we read this. For there is one God and one mediator who goes between God and man. One mediator, only one. The one mediator between God and man is this, Christ Jesus. He is the one. And look at Acts 4, verse 12. It says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the one name by which we must be saved. He's claiming exclusivity. He is the way, not a way, but the way. Not one option among many, but the only option. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Christians, I, I want to say something to you because, of course, I think the application is very clear. For those who are not followers of Jesus, Jesus is speaking to you and he's saying, I'm the way. But I have to speak to Christians here for a moment because it's the tendency of Christians to begin with Jesus, to say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to come to the Father through Jesus, but then after coming to Jesus, thinking that there's some other additional way that somehow you might mature to something, something higher, some secret way, some extra knowledge, some, some hidden path to God. You know, in Galatians chapter three, Paul has to write to the Galatians and said, are you so foolish? You started with faith in Jesus and now what? Will you, will you mature on to something else? Is there some other way that you're going to get to the Father? Some other way that God is going to listen to you? You see, Jesus says, I am, present tense, the way, and he will always be the way. As long as you are looking for the Father, Jesus is the way, and there is no other. For those who have begun to look down back alleys to find our way to the Father, some secret knowledge, maybe some book that you've never read before, but if you could just find it, it would offer you the three easy steps to find God. Let me tell you, it's a lie. There's only one way to the Lord, and that is Jesus. He is the way, but he is also the truth. That's the next thing which he says. You can see it there in verse six. I am the truth. Now, what does Jesus mean when he says, I am the truth? When Jesus says, I am the truth, he means what I say is right, what I do is right, and who I am is right. Jesus is consistently and thoroughly true. There is no falseness, no fakeness about Jesus. Jesus is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. There's no shadow of falseness in Jesus. He's completely and 100% true. In fact, he is the embodiment of truth. He is truth personified. Now, you might say, well, what does that have to do with me, and what does that mean for me? I'll tell you, it means everything. It means that Jesus is trustworthy, that you can, you can lean against him. You can build your life on him. And that means a lot, because I don't think that you can say with confidence that anybody else is completely true, is completely trustworthy. But Jesus is the truth. He cannot lie, he will not lie, and whatever he says is absolutely 100% true. And we know this because Jesus says that he is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's Colossians 1.15. And then he goes on to say about Jesus in Hebrews 1.3 that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. In other words, Jesus is completely true and he's the complete representation, the glorious, radiant representation of the Father. In fact, when he's saying this to the disciples, the disciples say, well, show us the Father. And Jesus says, well, if you've seen the Father, I'm sorry, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In verse seven, he says, if you had known me, you would have known my Father. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Jesus is saying, I'm completely true and I'm the completely true representation of the Father, which means you can completely and truly trust me unlike any other person. 
when I was in high school, I, I moved to a new school and I was trying to get to know people, trying to get to make friends. And somebody in one of, the, one of my um, classmates invited me to stay at his house. And my parents gave me permission, which was just crazy because they didn't know this kid. I didn't know him, but we were hoping to become friends. And I went to his house and he told one of our other classmates, one of his close friends, that we were going to sneak out at two o'clock in the morning and meet him downtown. And he gave him the intersection to meet at. And I thought, okay, here we go. We should go to sleep now so we can wake up at two so that we can be there on time to meet your friend. And he said, no. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, I don't, I'm, we're not gonna go. I don't feel like it anymore. And I said, but your, your friend, he'll, he'll be riding his bike downtown at two in the morning. He'll be waiting on the dark street corner and we won't be there. And he said, yes. I said, how, how can you do that to your friend? And that's exactly what happened. Left him. There was no texting. We could, I could not text him to say, don't go. No, the next day, I, oh, he, he said, hey, where were you? And his friend said, we decided not to show. And I think as, 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 um, as uh, crazy as that is, you have to acknowledge that you sometimes sense that even your friends are not completely trustworthy. And so Jesus says, I am the truth. You can trust me. I'll never lie. I'll never be false. We um, had a, a gathering. Oh, there we go. A gathering for training uh, with the staff. And we played this game. It was sort of an icebreaker. I don't know if you've played it before. Two truths and a lie. That's where each person tells two things that are true and one thing that's a lie. And then you try to guess which thing is the lie. And I thought, well, this is going to be very easy because I'm working with all these church people. I'll be able to spot the lie, no problem. I was shocked at what great liars I work with. I was just amazed. They were so good. And I have to say, they said the same thing about me. And I think this is, what does this say about us? It says that we need somebody who's true and trustworthy. Jesus is the truth the embodiment of the truth. He only speaks the truth. He's completely trustworthy. And so Jesus, when he says, I'm the only way to the Father, that's true. Jesus, when he says that if you confess your sins, he'll forgive you, that is true. Jesus, when he says that he loves you and he'll never forsake you, that's true. When Jesus says that the kingdom of God is near and that you should repent, that is true. When Jesus says you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is true. It's true. You can trust the truth, and Jesus is the truth, and you can build your life on the person, the truth of Jesus. He is a level rock to build your house. And if you build your house on anything other than the level rock, the rock which is true, then you're building on sinking sand. And the life that you build will one day come down in a great collapse. But the life which is built on the truth, the true level rock of Jesus Christ will stand. Jesus is the truth. He's, he's more than accurate information, though when I say that Jesus is the truth, I, what I'm saying is that he is a person and you can have a relationship with this person who is true. And what a relief to know that Jesus is the truth and we can completely trust him and lean on him and build our lives on him. Jesus is the way, he's the truth. And now finally, we must talk about this. It's so important, Jesus is the life. The life, not a life, not just one, one of many options. You could live all sorts of different lives and here's one that you could pick. You could pick a life with Jesus. But no, Jesus says, I am the life. What does he mean by that? Well, of course, looking at the context, you have to see that Jesus means that he is the eternal life. He is the life that brings you to the Father, that puts you in the home with many rooms where God the Father, the God of compassion, and the Father of comfort is there. He is this God, Jesus, who is the eternal life. But he's more than that. In John 10.10, 10, 
just a few passages earlier, Jesus says this. He says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is not only the eternal life, he is the abundant life. That means now, that means today. And we go back now to the disciples and to the tumultuous emotions that they were feeling, the, the spiritual roller coaster that they were on, that they were confused. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying. They didn't understand what Jesus was doing, what God was about because his thoughts are higher than ours. They were confused about this, but you have to acknowledge that the disciples had an abundant life, not smooth and easy, but full. Not, not a life without challenges, not a life where the road wasn't steep. Of course, the road of, of Christ is a steep road, but it was an abundant road. It was a comforting road. Don't you see that when the disciples are in turmoil, that Jesus speaks to them and comforts their hearts. He's the life. He is the abundant life, the full life. I know sometimes when life gets really busy, whether it's because of work or maybe um, you're studying a whole bunch because you're in school and, and you might say to somebody, I have no life, right? I'm so busy, like I'm so busy, I have no life. As if life existed in the abundance of, of plans, in the abundance of activity. But Jesus says, I am the life. In other words, the abundance of life exists not in the in the multitude of activities, but in the person of Jesus Christ. And can I ask you this? Are you centered on Jesus? What life are you living? Are you living the life, the life with Jesus, that you wake up in the morning and you speak with Jesus, that you go throughout your day, and as you're going throughout your day, you're asking God for guidance with decisions, with how you respond to people and circumstances, that you're opening up the scriptures to see Christ in the scriptures and to have your soul nourished. What I'm asking is this, are you building your life on Christ? Are you living the Christ life with Christ, in Christ? That is the abundant life, that is the eternal life. That is the life with Christ who is our savior. Jesus is the way and the way is a person and not a path. Jesus is the truth, and the truth is a person and not a fact. Jesus is the life. He is the life abundant and the life eternal. And so I wanna to speak to you, friends, and, and say to you, if you are weary, if you are burdened, if your heart is troubled, come to Jesus. Again and again and again, come to Jesus. He is the life. He will revive you and bring you to the Father. And there's no other way. The only way is Jesus. Don't look down any other spiritual back alleys. Jesus is the only way. Remember how the disciples were troubled and confused, how the disciples were finding that God's thoughts were above their thoughts, that God's ways were not their ways. They were discovering that God in his infiniteness was infinitely perplexing but also infinitely wonderful and when Jesus speaks to his disciples, just like he speaks to you, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. I'm going but I'm going to prepare a place for you and I will come back. And Jesus says in, in another place that he has not left us alone. But it's true that the, the person of Jesus, the, the, the body of Jesus has departed but he's given us his spirit which is always with us. For every person who believes, the Spirit of God dwells inside of you. For every person who has grabbed on in faith to Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God, the Father of compassion, is living inside of you, which is your deposit, your guarantee that you will be with him forever, that this road and journey of life may be hard and confusing, but the destination is never in doubt. Christ will come back to bring you home. I, I think that's the right way to put it, to bring you home to the Father, not a Father, but the Father, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Can I just say finally, bring your troubled hearts to Jesus and stop looking down, wandering down, stumbling down other paths. Walk in the way of Christ. Trust in the truth of Christ and receive the abundant and eternal life of Jesus. Let's pray.
Lord, uh, on the one hand, I, I think we would want to complain that we don't understand what you're doing. But let us pause and, and say thank you for being so brilliant and wonderful and, and above us. Thank you for having ways that are above our ways and thoughts that are above our thoughts. Now, Father, if we can't understand all of your thoughts and all of your ways, may we at least walk in the way of Jesus. May we at least trust in the truth of Christ. May we at least experience the abundance and eternal life, which is Jesus. Lord, rescue us from our tendency to search out other paths. Keep us from that wide path that leads to destruction. And may we walk with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now that we've um, taken some time to, to ponder this passage about Christ, here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to speak with Jesus in prayer. And we're going we're gonna to have a space for you to do that. There's this song which is going to talk about who Jesus is, about how he reaches out to you, about his character. And as you are listening to the words of this song, I, I want to ask you to think about whether you are putting your hope and trust in Jesus Christ whether you're following him with all your heart, mind, and soul. If your heart is troubled, and let me just say this, come to Jesus. And if you want somebody to pray with you while this song is being sung, there will be people standing up front who are ready to pray with you. And I have to say, I believe that prayer is immensely powerful, and it's God's desire that we would pray with each other and for each other. And part of the reason sometimes our heart is troubled is because we feel like we're all alone. But in prayer, we are reminded not only that God has us belonging to a family with brothers and sisters, but that we have a father who loves us, a father who's compassionate, a father who's comforting. And so I want to ask you to think about those things as, as this song is being sung. And if you would like prayer, I want to ask you to come forward and we'll pray with you.
I'd like everyone to stand together. Yeah. Amen. And at home, even if you want to stand up as well, and I just want to invite everyone, put your hands, just put your hands out like this. And would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we confess before you that we have made you small in our eyes. Lord, we confess before you that we have sought to find our strength in other things. Lord, we have sought to find our joy in other things. But Lord, we come before you in this moment and we just as a body, we say thank you. We say thank you, Lord, that you you have given everything, that you could be the way. Lord, that you are the author of all that is good and true. So, Lord, we submit to you, Lord, because you are our life. Lord, you are everything that we have. Lord, you are everything that we need. And so, Lord, we would all lift you and now in this moment and ask that you would give us the strength, especially in this holiday season, Lord. Father, in the busyness and every distraction that would take us away from you and what you did for us. As you came humbly as a baby and you lived a perfect life and you even allowed yourself to be hung on a cross for our sins, that you would be raised from the dead for us for me. So Lord, today we ask that you would give us the the reminder, Lord, the full knowledge of knowing that we are yours if we want to be, Lord. That we are your chosen sons and daughters. And Lord, we pray that that knowledge would be too wonderful, Lord. That we receive you and everything that you are in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen, amen. We'll hope you come back next week. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious. We'll see y'all next week.